The Hate You Give, Part 2, Five Weeks After It, Chapter 16. Miss Ofra arranged for me to do an interview with one of the national news programs today, exactly a week before I testify before the grand jury next Monday. It's around 6 o'clock when the limo that the news program sent arrives. My family's coming with me. I doubt my brothers will be interviewed, but Seven wants to support me. Sikani claims he does too, but really he's hoping he'll get discovered somehow with all those cameras around. My parents told him about everything. As much as he gets on my nerves, it was sweet when he gave me a handmade card that said sorry until I opened it. There was a drawing of me crying over Khalil, and I had devil horns. Sakani said he wanted it to be real. Little asshole. We all head out to the limo. Some neighbors watch curiously from their porches and yards. Mama made all of us, including Daddy, dress up like we're going to Christ Temple. Not quite Easter formal, but not diverse church casual. She says we're not going to have the news people thinking we're hood rats. So as we're walking to the car, she's all, when we get there, don't touch anything and only speak when somebody speaks to you. It's yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, or no, ma'am, and no, sir. Do I make myself clear? Yes, ma'am, the three of us say. All right, now, star, one of our neighbors calls out. I get that just about every day in the neighborhood now. Word spreading around the garden that I'm the witness. All right, now is more than a greeting. It's a simple way people let me know they got my back. The best part, though, it's never, all right, now, Big Mav's daughter who works in the store. It's always star. We leave in the limo. I drum my fingers on my knee as I watch the neighborhood pass by. I've talked to the detectives and the DA, and next week I'll talk to the grand jury. I've talked about that night so much I can repeat it back in my sleep, but the whole world will see this. My phone vibrates in my blazer pocket. A couple of texts from Chris. My mom wants to know what color your prom dress is. Something about the tailor needs to know ASAP. Oh shit, the junior-senior prom is Saturday. I haven't bought a dress. With all this Khalil stuff, I'm not sure I want to go. Mama said I need to get my mind off things. I said no. She gave me the look. So I'm going to the damn prom. This dictatorship she's on? Not cool. I text Chris back. Uh, light blue? He responds, you don't have a dress yet? I've got plenty of time, I write back. Just been busy. It's true. Miss Ofer prepared me for this interview every day after school. Some days we finish early and I helped out around just us for justice. Answered phones, passed out flyers, anything they needed me to do. Sometimes I listened in on their staff meetings as they discussed police reform ideas and the importance of telling the community to protest, not riot. I asked Dr. Davis if just us could have a roundtable discussion at Williamson like they do at Garden High. He said he didn't see the need. Chris replies to my prom text. Okay, if you say so. By the way, Vante says sup. About to kill him on Madden. He needs to stop calling me Bieber, though. After all that white boy trying to be black shit Devante said about Chris, lately he's at Chris's house more than I am. Chris invited him over to play Madden, and all of a sudden, they're bros. According to Devante, Chris's massive video game collection makes up for his whiteness. I told Devante he's a video game thought. He told me to shut up. We're cool like that, though. We arrive at a fancy hotel downtown. A white guy in a hoodie waits under the awning leading up to the door. He has a clipboard under his arm and a Starbucks cup in his hand. Still, he somehow manages to open the limo door and shake our hands when we get out. John, the producer, it's a pleasure to meet you. He shakes my hand a second time. And let me guess, your star. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having the bravery to do this. There's that word again, bravery. Brave people's legs don't shake. Brave people don't feel like puking. Brave people sure don't have to remind themselves how to breathe if they think about that night too hard. If bravery is a medical condition, everybody's misdiagnosed to me. John leads us through all of these twists and turns, and I'm so glad I'm wearing flats. He can't stop talking about how important the interview is and how much they want to get the truth out there. He's not exactly adding to my bravery. He takes us to the hotel courtyard where some camera operators and other show people are setting up. In the middle of the chaos, the interviewer, Diane Carey, is getting her makeup done. It's weird seeing her in the flesh and not as a bunch of pixels on TV. When I was younger, every single time I spent the night at Nana's house, she made me sleep in one of her long-ass nightgowns, say my bedtime prayers for at least five minutes, and watch Diane Carey's news reports so I could be knowledgeable of the world. 
Hi, Mrs. Carey's face lights up when she sees us. She comes over, and I gotta give the makeup lady props because she follows her and keeps working like a pro. Mrs. Carey shakes our hands. Diane, so nice to meet you all, and you must be star, she says to me. Don't be nervous. This will simply be a conversation between the two of us. The whole time she talks, some guy snaps photos of us. Yeah, this will be a normal conversation. Star, we are thinking we could get shots of you and Diane walking and talking around the courtyard, John says. Then we'll go up to the suite and do the conversations between you and Diane, you, Diane, and Miss Ofra, and finally you and your parents. After that, we'll be all set. One of the production people mics, up, mics me up as John gives me a rundown of this walk and talk thing. It's only a transitional shot, he says. Simple stuff. Simple my ass. The first time I practically power walk. The second time I walk like I'm in a funeral processional and I can't a- answer Miss Carrie's questions. I never realized walking and talking required so much coordination. Once we get that right, we take an elevator to the top floor. John leads us to a huge suite. Seriously, it looks like a penthouse overlooking downtown. About a dozen people are setting up cameras and lighting. Miss Ofra is there in one of her Khalil shirts and a skirt. John says they're ready for me. I sit in the love seat across from Mrs. Carey. I've never been able to cross my legs for whatever reason, so that's out of the question. They check my mic, and Mrs. Carey tells me to relax. Soon the cameras are rolling. Millions of people around the world have heard the name Khalil Harris, she says, and they've developed their own ideas of who he was. Who was he to you? More than he may have ever realized. One of my best friends, I say. We knew each other since we were babies. If he were here, he'd point out that he was five months, two weeks, and three days older than me. We both chuckle at that. But that's who Khalil is, was. Damn, it hurts to correct myself. He was a jokester. Even when things were hard, he'd somehow find some light in it. And he, my voice cracks. I know it's corny, but I think he's here. His nosy ass would show up just to make sure I say the right things. Probably calling his number one, calling me his number one fan or some annoying title that only Khalil can think of. I miss that boy. He had a big heart, I say. I know that some people call him a thug, but if you knew him, you'd know that that wasn't the case at all. I'm not saying he was an angel or anything, but he wasn't a bad person. He was a... I shrug. He was a kid. She nods. He was a kid. He was a kid. What do you think about people who focus on the not-so-good aspect of him, she asks. The fact that he may have sold drugs? Miss Ofra once said that this is how I fight with my voice. So I fight. I hate it, I say. If people knew why he sold drugs, they wouldn't talk about him that way. Mrs. Carey sits up a little. Why did he sell them? I glance at Miss Ofra, and she shakes her head. During all our prep meetings, she advised me not to go into details about Khalil selling drugs. She said the public doesn't have to know about that. But then I look at the camera, suddenly aware that millions of people will watch this in a few days. King may be one of them. Although his threat is loud in my head, it's not nearly as loud as what Kenya said that day in the store. Khalil would defend me. I should defend him. So I gear up to throw a punch. Cleo's mom is a drug addict, I tell Mrs. Carey. Anybody who knew him knew how much that bothered him and how much he hated drugs. He only sold them to help her out of a situation with the biggest drug dealer and gang leader in the neighborhood. Mrs. Zofra noticeably sighs. My parents have wide eyes. It's dry snitching, but it's snitching. Anybody who knows anything about Garden Heights will know exactly who I'm talking about. Hell, if they watch Mr. Lewis's interview, they can figure it out. But hey, since King wants to go around the neighborhood lying and saying Khalil repped his set, I can let the world know Khalil was forced to sell drugs for him. His mom's life was in danger, I say. That's the only reason he'd ever do something like that. He wasn't a gang member. He wasn't? No, ma'am. He never wanted to fall into that type of life. But I guess I think about Devante for some reason. I don't understand how everyone can make it seem like it's okay he got killed if he was a drug dealer and a gangbanger. A hook straight to the jaw. The media, she asks. Yes, ma'am. It seems like they always talk about what he may have said, what he may have done, what he may not have done. I didn't know a dead person could be charged in his own murder, you know? The moment I say it, I know it's my jab to the mouth.
Mrs. Carey asks for my account of that night. I can't go into a lot of details. Miss Ofer told me not to, but I did tell her we did everything 115 asks and never once cussed at him like his father claims. I tell her how afraid I was, how Cleo was so concerned about me that he opened the door and asked if I was okay. So he didn't make a threat on Officer Cruz's life? She questions. No, ma'am. His exact words were, Star, are you okay? That was the last thing he said, and... I'm ugly crying, describing the moment when the shots rang out and Cleo looked at me for the last time, how I held him in the street and saw his eyes gloss over. I tell her 115 pointed his gun at me. He pointed his gun at you, she asks. Yes, ma'am. He kept it on me until the other officers arrived. Behind the cameras, Mama puts her hand over her mouth. Fury strikes, sparks in Daddy's eyes. Miss Ofer looks stunned. It's another jab. See, I only told Uncle Carlos that part. Mrs. Carey gives me a Kleenex and a moment to get myself together. Has this situation made you fearful of cops, she eventually asks. I don't know, I say truthfully. My uncle's a cop. I know not all cops are bad, and they risk their lives, you know. I'm always scared for my uncle, but I'm tired of them assuming, especially when it comes to black people. You wish that more cops wouldn't make assumptions about black people, she clarifies. Right. This all happened because he, I can't say his name, assumed that we were up to no good because we're black and because of where we live. We were just two kids minding our business, you know? His assumption killed Khalil. It could have killed me. A kick straight to the ribs. If, o- if Officer Cruz was sitting right here, Miss Carey says, what would you say to him? I blink several times. My mouth waters, but I swallow. No way I'm going to let myself cry or throw up from thinking about that man. If he were sitting here, I don't have enough black Jesus in me to tell him I forgive him. Instead, I'd probably punch him. Straight up. But Miss Ofer says this interview is the way I fight. When you fight, you put yourself out there, not caring who you hurt or if you'll get hurt. So I throw one more blow, right at 115. I'd ask him if he wished he shot me too.